Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. I want to congratulate SAC for organizing such a wonderful event and the team has been spectacular. Um, I am, I'm really happy to be here. I'll be talking about uh, long-term growth. I'll talk about GDP. Uh, I just learned that later in the afternoon, Mr. Tsao will talk about happiness and he told me that we'll keep criticize everything that I say about GDP. So if you're not happy with what I'm saying, you'll hear later the criticisms. That was <laughs> uh, a joke, but um, basically I'll talk about simplifying the world uh, in, my, uh, in my view. So what is it all about, all this growth? First, let me just give you some data. I'll show you a lot of data and I'll try to build a framework of understanding growth. Uh, and figure out whether actually growth will accelerate or decelerate given all these discussions about AI uncertainty and so on. This is the world GDP in um, 2022 as measured uh, by uh, its purchasing power parity. The biggest economy in the world according to this number is China. This basically adjusts for difference in price levels. It's about 18.5% of the world GDP then you can see is the United States, Europe, and so on. So you can think about this as a distribution of economic power around the world. You know, China has become the country that produces more stuff than any other country in the world. The question is, how far can it go? And will it continue to grow? And I'll try to answer some of these questions today. Here is the world population as of last year, nearly 8 billion people. Uh, India actually has become already the most populous country in the world, and then we have China and so on. The reason that I'm showing you this chart is because, again, I'll, I'll be showing you linear things, and so maybe they're too simple, but at the end of the day, we have to get the intuition of what is going on. I will argue that there is something that we call the technological frontier that moves at a constant speed. So it's actually a straight line in a special scale. If the country is rich, so horizontal access time, vertical access income per capita, how rich the country is. If the country is rich in 1950, the fastest way it can grow is by pushing this frontier, by innovating, coming up with new ideas, new products, and um, innovating continuously. If the country is poor, remember that the vertical axis measures how rich countries are, then this country has the potential of growing very rapidly until it converges to the frontier. And the reason is very simple. All of you know this extremely well. You've read it a thousand times in newspapers. Poor countries have low incomes. Low incomes means low wages. With low wages, capital is attracted to build their factories there and, and use the low labor cost. As they build factories, output is growing. As output is growing, wages are growing, income is growing, and then you converge to the frontier and you have to innovate. Let's suppose that this is the basic economic model that you'll see in all textbooks. Let's suppose that this model is right. And by some time, let's say 2050, every country around the world converges to the frontier. And for the sake of argument, let's say that the average income per capita is about, let's say, $80,000. If this happens, then the GDP of the country will be given by income per capita, GDP divided by populations times the number of people we have. If we produce $1,000 worth of output and we have 1 million people, then it will be 1 billion and so on. Now, that, that's an identity as you can see. If this happens, then you can take this pie chart of population, multiply each one of the sectors by 80,000, it will be a bigger pie chart, and however, the distribution will be the same. So in other words, when you look at this, if this world materializes, this is the distribution of economic power. Many people have already thought about this, have uh, looked at things like this, but what is probably more shocking and less noticeable at first sight is that the advanced economy, especially Western Europe and the United States, will be less than 10% of the world output. Today, they're about 50% or so, 40 to 50%. If this happens, then the world will be very different from the one that we have observed in the last 200 years or so. So will it happen is obviously the big question because 
there are many questions along the way that might not be answered properly. So let's start with something easier. Is it happening? In here you have the distribution of world output from 1980 until 2020. The blue countries are the rich countries. In 1980, the rich countries were producing two thirds of the world output. The second wave of world globalization started in the 1990s. By the way, the first wave of the world globalization was from 1870 to 1914, ending with the first world war. Uh, and during that time, trade was at very similar level that we have today. But since 1990s, you see the decline of the share of rich economies, now to 48%. And will it go down to 10, 12% is a big question. So I usually have, you know, this is a topic of economic growth development that I usually take like four hours to discuss it. But in the next few minutes, I will try to say that the only reason, and I'll emphasize this, the only reason that this world will not materialize is if the governments of these countries scrub their countries. If they do everything right, the United States, the Western world cannot stop this convergence. But if the countries, the governments in India, China, and so on, do something that is not right, then it will not materialize. So, the final chart before I start building a framework of thinking about these things is the world income per capita from year one. There is no year zero, but I always like putting it here, like you know, when time starts and so on. It's only 2,000 years ago, year one until today. This is the world income per capita in real terms in year one. And if you are interested in the break, I can explain to you how we calculate these things. Year one income per capita was $900. Today, about 21,000 or so. Now, what you see, the reason I'm showing you this chart is because we'll talk about innovation, AI, and all these things later on. The main reason I'm showing you this chart is because you realize very quickly that for the first 18 centuries, not much happened. So you can use all kinds of measures of uh, production, consumption, and so on. 18th century, the world income increased by 50% income per capita. And then from 1820, so to something like 1400, from 1820 until today, it increased by, let's say, 15 times. So growth is a new phenomenon. It happened only in the last 200 years. And today we're thinking, will growth continue? You know, we are living in these very uncertain worlds. It's becoming more and more difficult to manage to deal with all these things. At the same time, there is AI and everybody believes that AI will propel us to a new world. To understand where this will happen or not, we have to understand what happened in 1820 and why all of a sudden growth in the world is so much faster than in the previous thousands of years. And the more you think about it, the more interesting the question becomes. To be honest, there are many answers out there, but the key answer that most economists I think will subscribe to is that this growth is driven by innovation. And as long as there are incentives to innovate, protection of intellectual property rights, patent laws, and so on, then this growth will continue. This growth has no limit. And I know that that's a very controversial statement when we talk about sustainability, but I'll dis address that as well. So we will come back to, to this, but remember now that this increase has been only in the last 200 years. So now, how can we know that growth will continue at what rate and so on? To build a model, to build a framework of thinking about this, I'll just show you data. I'm not going to show you any equations. This is the income per capita in the United States from 1870 until today. This is what we call logarithmic scale, uh, because if I show you a regular scale, you'll see charts that look like this. And nobody in the room, no matter how good you are, can tell me whether growth is accelerating, decelerating, uh, or constant. What the logarithmic scale is buying you is that if you see a straight line, then you know that growth is constant and the slope is the growth rate. So this is US GDP in, uh, per capita, income per capita for 150 years. You can see here the Great Depression from 1929 to 1933. And then you see also that there was a big expansion during World War II for the US. 
But what is amazing about this chart is that for 150 years, the United States has been growing at a roughly a constant rate of about 2% or so. Think about this, in 1933, when the Great Depression ended, the US could have continued with the same speed as before, so the same slope, but at a lower level. But it didn't. It returned back to the original red line. In 1944, when the, 45, when the Second World War ended, again, they could have continued at a higher level, but it didn't, it went back. A lot of things happened during this period, like you know, there are depressions, there are oil price shocks, there's COVID-19, there's a great recession. And yet, the economy continues to grow at exactly the same speed, about 1.8 or 2% per year. The more you think about this, the more shocking it is, because during this period, so many things happened. First, there was a steam engine, railroads, people, early industrialization, then electricity was discovered, electronics, people flying to space. Every 10 years, there's something happening, and yet the economy is growing at the same speed as before. So the more you think about it, the more shocking it is because regulation changed, rules changed, population growth changed. The denominator was changing at a different speed, and yet it is the same speed. Let me show you how the press is describing these revolutions. By the way, in the 1990s, those of you who were following the business press at the time, maybe you remember that we already proclaimed the end of business cycles. Business Week had this, had this issue, the end of the business cycle, because as they wrote, it seems too, almost too good to be true with the information technology sector leading the way. We have enjoyed 4% growth, and this is a spectacular boom, not built on smoke and mirrors. It is massive risk investments in information technology and so on. There was also deregulation that increased flexibility and the result is the so-called new economy, fast growth and low inflation. From Forbes, we read that we're in a period of the most wonderful progress in science and invention that especially has applied to communication and transportation that this or any other country has ever known. It is our presently great fortune to live in what in the light of history will be recognized as a golden age of the American industry. Now, these are very similar editorials. They're not very shy about the achievements of the US economy, but the big difference was that the Business Week article appeared in January 2000, and Forbes was published in 1929, the summer of 1929. When you read them, you say, oh my God, we are so good, we, it's a golden age, We've never, no, nobody has seen everything, anything like this before. As we say today, nobody has seen anything like this before, and it's true, but, the speed at which the frontier is moving is still the same at 2%. As long as there are incentives to innovate, this speed will continue. And uh, I think, I think that your best prediction is that it will continue for foreseeable future. But how can you say that speed will continue and we can continue to grow given that we have finite natural resources? To address this issue, I decided to look at oil because people have been concerned for many, many times about the um, oil uh, and the weather will run out of it given that it's such an important source of energy. Here I plot the real price of oil, not that there is a fake price of oil, but the real price of oil is actually the price of oil divided by the regular price level. And uh, you can see here the oil price shock in 1973, 1981, 2007. Now I want to use this to explain how we think about natural resources and to think what are the natural resources that might actually stop us from growing. So in, 1970, in 1960s, a very well-intentioned group of people, academics, diplomats, politicians, got together to form the Club of Rome. And the Club of Rome was uh, basically, it's a, it's a think tank that tries to understand sustainability and so on. Very, very, I think, at noble purposes. They commissioned a study to a group of academics, and they, the book was published, The Limits to Growth in 1972. Four professors published this book. This is a very small book, 100 pages, small format, but it is the most depressing reading that you can get. So if one day you feel like I'm too cheerful, I'm too happy, you know, go and read the book and you'll see it's very depressing. So what happened after that? Well, they actually predicted, in, there is a forecast in their book that the world will run out of oil 
in 1990. So in 1990, we'll use the last drop of oil. Today, as all of you know, we have more proven oil reserves than ever before. So obviously, they were wrong. It's not a small mistake. It's a very big mistake. So to understand what was, went wrong, we have to look back and start thinking. What happened after the first oil price shock? Well, prices were 250 at that time, and they increased to about $10 a barrel. Well, the first thing that they started thinking about, how can we find more? At 250, explorations were not for profitable, but at $10 a barrel, actually, it made a lot of sense. Second, it became very expensive to drive cars that use a lot of gasoline, so they started designing less, uh, more efficient cars, so use less of uh, this resource. When the Iranian revolution happened and the next oil price shock happened, then people started developing technology to drill deep down into the sea and get oil, which was not a, 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 a achievable before. Now, they developed these technologies not because they wanted to develop the technologies, but because it was profitable to develop these technologies. And then the oil price shock in 2007, I don't know how many of you remember that oil increased to $150 a barrel at the time. In 2007, in January, at the OPEC meetings, the Minister of Oil of Saudi Arabia made a statement. We have to keep the price of oil below $125 a barrel because above that level, alternative sources of energy become feasible. So the other thing you can do is use alternatives. The main point I want to make here is that if there is a market for natural resources, then at the end of the day, this market will give you a signal that you're running out of this resource or it becomes too expensive and you come up with new ideas. In the 1950s with industrialization in Europe, in Korea and so on, Japan, still became expensive, people switch, started switching to aluminum. Then aluminum became expensive. Today, Boeing 787 has more carbon and plastics than metals. The point, however, is that there are resources like carbon that are not priced. And we continuously wait, and we wait to see when is the feedback mechanism going to hit us. And it might be too late. So when people ask me, what do you think that can change this straight line? Not the finiteness of natural resources that are priced, but the natural resources that are not priced like carbon and so on. And I have a lot of slides also on that. At some point, we can discuss it. So let's go back to understanding growth and understanding where innovation is heading. My simple model was saying that the world should be looking like that. Countries that are poor grow very fast. Countries that are rich grow slowly at the frontier. And here, I look at the G7 countries. You can see that until 1945, not much is happening. The US is growing at the same rate as before, but Japan grows also at the same rate. So instead of closing the gap, it actually keeps the gap uh, throughout this period. And then in 1945, something happened. Japan started growing very rapidly at 7, 10, 14% per year, like China in recent years. In 10 years, it recovered from the war. In the next seven years, caught up with the trend, but it continued to grow. In the West, people were looking at this and saying, oh, Japan is doing so many amazing thing, things. It, they will catch up with us, they will grow, and they will become the richest country in the world. You think that I'm making up this chart? This chart, actually, that you see with Japan crossing over in this way was on the top of the textbook cover in the 1970s. Now, in the, actually in the limits of growth, they were predicting that by year 2000, Japan will have twice the US income per capita. But it doesn't work this way. It doesn't work this way because here, Japan was growing through imitation and replication. They look at the US, they take an American car, they disassemble it, reassemble it, call it Toyota. Maybe it's a better car, but that's not innovation. And the speed at which you can replicate this thing can be very high. The only thing that you need to do is invest in physical capital and in human capital. If you do this investment, like China is doing, you can grow at 7, 10, 14% if you're a poor country. But once you reach the frontier, then you have to start innovating because everything you could replicate has been replicated 
and most of these countries, as you can see, have parallel lines growing at the same 2% of income per capita in the last uh, 50 years or so. Then we can go to the rest of the world and we can see that the patterns are very different. I'm not going to do this because you know, uh, you know what is happening in the world. So in some countries, our models work really well. So the ones on the left side, we call them growth miracles countries that have transformed themselves in the last 60 years or so. But on the other side, you have growth disasters as well. Like in Central African Republic, in Angola, today people are much poorer than they used to be in, the, in 1962 with this negative growth rate. So our model works, but sometimes actually it doesn't work. And we have to understand also what is happening to the right side of this column. So what is driving growth differences across countries and what is driving growth at the frontier? First, output is produced by combining physical capital, physical capital and labor in the process of production and you get output. So the first thing to do is to increase the inputs in production, you get more outputs. This is called extensive growth. This is how India is growing, this is how China is growing, this is how Singapore grew in the 60s, 70s, and the 80s. This is how all of the countries that are catching up are growing, by increasing, increasing the inputs in the process of production. The second way to grow is called intensive growth, and that is to look at this black box here and improve the productivity come up with new ideas, with new processes, with more efficiency. The important point in this slide, however, is that growth comes from a sacrifice. You have to sacrifice your consumption today, put aside money and invest in physical capital, in human capital, or invest in R&D in order to generate more ideas and propel this frontier. There are tons of uh, charts out there that show that indeed you can see that countries that have invested more grow faster, but I want to, to point out something different. We know now that there are three things that determine differences across countries. Either they don't have capital, poor countries, they don't have human capital, or they don't have productivity. These are the only three things that actually matter at the end of the day. Two economists from Stanford, Hall and Jones, in 1999 published a paper looking at differences across countries. And I'll illustrate this by looking at the United States and Niger. They found actually a really interesting answer. They said, okay, there is a difference between the US and Niger, pretty big difference. What if we take American machines and we take them to Niger and we give them to the workers that work with American machines? The answer from the statistical analysis came absolutely shocking. Because with American machines from 862, income per capita will go to 1,292. So only 50% more. What if you take American machines and American workers and you ship them to Niger and you leave them to work there, but you don't change anything else? Well, human capital is more important in this process, so it will act actually add more, so times five. But still, there is a humongous gap of $27,000 per capita that does, is not explained by human capital or physical capital. In other words, poor countries are poor not because they lack human capital or physical capital, but because of the residual productivity. And then Colin Jones went around and tried to figure out what does it mean? What is this purple area? What can explain this purple area across countries? For Singapore, for Germany, the purple area will be very small. It might be even positive in the other direction. But for some poor countries, it's very big. So they went, got some data, and they realized that basically the conditions for doing business in Niger is so bad that you put the best factory there with the best workers, you have to protect your factory from being looted, you have to spend so much money in corruption that it costs you $27,000 in income per capita. And that is why poor countries are poor. And this is a very important point because sometimes some governments will tell you, come and invest in my country, we'll give you investment tax credit and we'll educate our workers. If they don't change the environment for doing business, not much will happen eventually. So, 
What are the determinants of economic growth? Productivity at the frontier. We said that that's very important. Investment in physical capital and human capital. But then what drives investment? And the answer that the economics profession came to in, 2000, in about 30 years ago, institutions, property rights, absence of corruption, good governments, and so on. Now, in 2005, I was teaching at INSEAD, our executive MBA, and after four hours, and imagine it's a four hour session. After four hours, one of my students raised his hand and said, these charts are really powerful and they're very interesting and very colorful, but I still don't understand what is driving growth. I mean, after four hours, it's very discouraging when somebody tells you this, what am I doing here? So, and he said, you know, I had this really great course in marketing where we learned about the four P's, price, pro promotion, product, and placement. And he said, can you give me something like this to understand growth? <laughs> exactly, I laughed at this. I said, you know, I cannot do this. You know, I'm telling you stories, but it's based on theory with equations, with differential equations, that I'm trying to make it as, a, as an intuitive story. You know, economics is a real science, it's not marketing. But <laughs> some people did not take this that well, so I went back to my office, I started thinking, and the next day I came back with the four eyes of economic growth. So. <laughs> It, it had to be four, obviously. So the four eyes are very intuitive. The first one is innovation at the frontier. This is how countries are growing. US, Japan, France, Germany, Singapore, Australia, and so on. The second eye is the initial condition. If you're a rich country, you cannot grow fast, period. I mean, it's just not possible because the speed of innovation is very slow. But if you're a poor country, you have the potential of catching up. So you can be like this or you can be like that. To realize the potential, you need investment. Investment in physical capital has to be at least 25%. A quarter of your income that you generate, you have to put back in the economy in order to grow a bigger economy and create a miracle. These three eyes, all of you who have studied economics will recognize that basically describe the standard solo model of growth, a paper that was written in 1956 and Robert Sol received a Nobel Prize for it. Policymakers around the world started jumping up and down in joy because they said, I know how to make a poor country rich. Just invest. And the World Bank chief economist in 1965 made the prediction that from 1965, the fastest growing region in the world will be Africa. Africa was a growth disaster, as we saw from the previous table. But the, he was saying this thing because there was a lot of investment from the World Bank, from other very uh, well-intentioned government, but the important thing for investment that it has to be predominantly private. Governments have a much more important role to do, and that is to build the environment for this investment to happen, to build the institutions. And uh, if they build the institutions, then the whole thing happens. So I have some illustrations that I'll skip uh, of uh, the four eyes. I'm using Singapore. I want just to spend the last few uh, minutes on this chart. So I was talking, I usually talk a lot about institutions, which ones are important and so on. And again, one of our students said, but wait a second, it was in 2005. If institutions are so important, why is China growing? because China does not have the institutions that most people think are relevant. So I decided, let me go and check what is really happening with institutions and growth. And I took this data from the World Bank. There are six indicators, uh, voice and accountability, which is uh, democracy, uh, political stability, uh, government effectiveness, control of corruption, and quality of regulation. So just regulation. The indicators are from minus 2.5 to plus 2.5 every year. The World Bank constructs an indicator for every country. I take the six here and I put them on this side. On the horizontal axis is income per capita, rich countries, poor countries, low quality institutions, high quality institutions. So I mean the business school, so it's a two by two matrix. Now, what is really amazing about this is that first, there is almost no one here. There is not a single poor country that has good quality institutions. And sometimes people notice that in one of the tables, Botswana was sitting there, and they were asking why Botswana growing so fast and so on. 
because Botswana was sitting here, one of the poorest countries in the world, but it maintained good quality institutions, borrowed some consultants from Singapore and from, um, uh, from Hong Kong, how to control corruption, and they grew faster than anybody else until 2007. The second thing, which is probably the most important one, is that here you don't have a very strong relationship between institutions and income per capita. In other words, with the same institutional quality, you can be with $800 income per capita, or you can be sitting here with $20,000. So institutions, for the initial part, do not matter so much. But then here, there is nobody as well. There is not one rich country that has good quality, uh, low quality institutions. And number four, here the relationship is very strong. The richer you want to be, the better your institutions have to be. So what the reason why we created this is because of China. At the time, China was sitting here, and I started giving these talks about the wall. So I call this the wall because of China. And the prediction was that once China reaches the wall, which is about $20,000 income per capita, if they don't reform, then it will stop growing. Because historically, we have never seen anything, anybody on the other side. And then people were saying, but wait a second, you know, China is different. We don't know what they do, but they know what they do. And they will go on the other side and they'll be a rich country with these institutions. Maybe, but remember that the Soviet Union collapsed exactly at this level. The Soviet Union was growing faster than anybody else in the 50s and the 60s, started stagnating in the 70s, and then in the 80s they changed several secretaries of the Communist Party and then collapsed. So what will happen in China is a big, big question. We've been asking this question for the last few years, but now China is sitting right here. And my prediction is that, yeah, you can go a little bit on the other side, but it's very unlikely that it will become a $20,000, uh, $80,000 economy if it doesn't grow. And this is how China has been growing. The, the line that you see there, the green line, is actually China over time. The other dots are stuck in 2019, but China is growing over time without changing its institution until it reaches this area, which is called now the middle income trap. And I am done. I, I have some some stuff on the on carbon and so on, but summarizing things, you know, it's the advanced economies are growing at the frontier. Sorry, the advanced economies are growing at the frontier, potential to grow and the four eyes. So let me stop here and see if there are any questions. Do I have time for a question? You I definitely think the, the have lecture questions. was very clear, so probably people don't have any but questions. You definitely have questions. Over to you thank again. You. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I'm looking at the, the first question that has, how would this linear growth have changed if economies factored in the cost of externalities or the cost of climate change, for example? I think it's an excellent question, and I think that, uh, to be completely honest, I don't know the answer to the question, but I think that that's where we are going now in trying to quantify these things and trying to get to price these externalities. I think that also from an investment point of view, we're discussing this in the morning, we have a very clear understanding of what is the risk-return trade-off, but we have not a very good understanding of risk-return impact trade-off. We assume, very often in conversations, people assume that return and impact are negatively correlated. So it will cost you something if you don't impact. But of course, there are people who believe that that's not true. But it's an empirical question. I believe that if we change the, uh, if we start incorporating the externalities, or more generally, if we care about welfare, and I think Mr. Tsao will be talking exactly about this, the purpose and happiness and so on, then we'll have a very different picture. And I think that the economics profession is moving in this direction. We have to think about the lifespan that we have. We have to think about leisure and not only income per, per capita. I, I agree, that's a great question. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm I have a question that is unrelated to growth. China and US conflict represent a threat to global prosperity. Can Southeast Asia play a significant role in assuring and driving global term growth? I, I think it, this question is probably not, uh, I'm not the best person to answer this question, but what I will say is that 
in my view, there are so many challenges that we underestimate today in the global political shift that we observe. I created a slide of the democracy index in the world where democracy, each country has a reading for democracy. I weigh the index for each country by its GDP. So in economic terms, for the first time since 2020, the world has a negative minus 0.1 reading. It used to be 0.9, these are the same indicators. It has been going down and it has become negative. And this conflict in general, I think it is, uh, is symbolic for something else that is happening. I personally believe that there is a bit of a, an issue with the world becoming more authoritarian, more autocratic, even within the democratic countries. And how this will pan out at the end of the day, uh, I'm not sure. Okay, let me see if there is another question here. Um, China, leapfrog on, a, I, I cannot open it, show more, okay. China's leapfrog in electromobility has opened a window of opportunity for it to catch up with the global competitors. Do you foresee other technological breakthroughs happening in Asia? Yes, I think that actually a lot of things will be happening in Asia, but to understand where China is, because in, in a different setting, somebody said, but wait a second, you know, China uh, will not be able to catch up because of all these restrictions now that the US government is imposing and so on. There is just so much more to do in the catching up process before you get to the AI chips and all these things to be a driver of your growth. So I think that the leapfrogging is possible. It opens some opportunities for generating more ideas, but I don't think that this is the main engine of growth at the end of the day for China. And then I have a question, how do you promote LGBTQ in your company? Uh, I, I think that actually we did a lot. Uh, we, during my time, we created, uh, you know, we created clubs for the students in this area. I think that it's important for diversity, but I'm not the dean anymore, so I'm not sure that I can do anything more. So on this note, again, thank you very much for your attention, for your questions, and I wish you all the best. <laughs>